Before you see the next clip, make a list of the planets, starting with the planet nearest the Sun. Write down at least one fact about each planet. Watch the clip and see how the information compares with your notes. This is NASA's Deep Space Mission Control. It's used for the Voyager mission. Notice not was, but is. And that's because 17 years since its launch, Voyager is still exploring. A remarkable journey for a remarkable craft. Here it is. This is a life-size model of Voyager, so you can see all the relevant parts. And these are the cameras that it uses to take images of the planets. Other experiments too, down this science boom, are detectors of plasma and cosmic rays. This huge dish is what it uses to receive signals from the Earth and transmit other signals back to Earth. Those signals were to give some amazing pictures of the planets. But before they arrived, just what did we know about what's out there? Well, what we call our solar system is a family of nine planets moving around the sun. Their predictable paths are called orbits. Closest to the sun is the planet Mercury. Next comes Venus. And then our own planet, Earth. Still moving away from the Sun, our other neighbour is Mars, the red planet. Next comes the asteroid belt, a zone made up of hundreds of thousands of bits of rock of all sizes, from large to small, like this one. Once part of the asteroid belt, it's now on Earth. But how did it get here? To answer that question, I went to find astronomer John Moseley. Hi, John. Hi. This is terrifically heavy. I mean, what exactly is it? Well, we call it a meteorite, and it's really part of the metallic core of a small planet that formed and shattered billions of years ago between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter in what we call the asteroid belt. Jupiter's gravity prevented a large planet from forming inside its orbit, and several hundred small planets formed instead. But you don't want lots of planets in the same orbit if you expect them to hang around, and they didn't. They shattered, collided, and if the fragments make their way to the Earth, they fall as meteorites, and this is one of them. But it came from the asteroid belt. What's inside that asteroid belt? Well, at the center of the solar system, we have the Sun and the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then their moons. What do we know about those planets? Well, Mercury is very similar to our moon. It's closer to the Sun, and it's larger, but when you think of the moon, then you're really thinking of Mercury. <laughs> Venus is very similar to the Earth in size. It too is closer to the Sun and that makes it warmer. But Venus has a very thick atmosphere and that's important because the atmosphere traps the Sun's heat. It's what we call the greenhouse effect and on Venus the greenhouse effect has run away, it's out of control and it's made the planet so hot that lead would melt on the surface. So if astronauts ever go to Venus they're going to have a very tough time surviving that environment. And then beyond the Earth, we have Mars. And Mars is a junior version of the Earth. It's a vast, rocky plain with some canyons and volcanoes. So it would be familiar, like, a, like the high desert. But the main difference for our purposes is that it has a very thin atmosphere, almost no atmosphere at all. So if astronauts were to visit Mars, which I presume they will someday, they'll have to take spacesuits. It'll be very similar to living and working on our moon. And beyond the planet Mars is the asteroid belt and then the outer planets. What are these outer planets? The first is Jupiter, orbiting 780 million kilometers away from the Sun. Then comes Saturn, double that distance away. Next is Uranus, then Neptune, and finally Pluto with its strange orbit. All of these outer planets were thought to be very similar, but they're so far away, they're very difficult to see with ground-based telescopes. That's where Voyager came in. Voyager was designed to look at the outer planets. These are four giant planets, a hundred of times larger than Earth, are very different. They are very cold, icy, they are gaseous, they have rings around them, they have lots of moons around them. So Voyager was sent to look at this set of planets which, from far away, bear a very strong family resemblance. And we got closer to them. We found out that they are individuals with their own personalities. But 
how do you send a spacecraft billions of kilometers away from the Earth without any refueling, and at a speed fast enough for it to arrive in our lifetime? Something more than just rocket propulsion was needed. Just down the road from the Jet Propulsion Laboratories is another part of the Californian Institute of Technology. And it was here, in 1965, that a student had the idea of using the pull of a planet to accelerate a moving spacecraft and sling it towards another planet, like this. So why does this happen? Well, all masses attract each other. When the mass becomes as large as a planet, the force of attraction is very strong. It's called gravity. As Voyager approaches a planet, it's pulled inwards by the planet's gravity. It's the same with my apple. If I let go, the force of gravity pulls it down towards the center of the Earth. But scientists calculated a space route for Voyager, which meant that it got close enough to the planets to feel the pull, but not too close so that it crashed into them. We have learned that if you come close enough to a planet without crashing into it, you gain some of its energy. Uh, this is similar to someone uh, on a carousel holding his hand out. If a passerby is running, you grab the hand of that person for a few seconds and then let go. When you let go, you have more energy, have more speed. We've learned that if we come close enough to those planets at a given angle, at a given direction, when we leave after the flyby, we can leave with a higher speed and in a direction we choose. This is how we guide it. Voyager, you know, with a very small amount of energy through the four planets. We used what we call the gravity assist. NASA launched two voyages on what became known as the Grand Tour. The trajectory would take them first to Jupiter, then onwards to Saturn, where Voyager 1 would head upwards out of the solar system, leaving Voyager 2 headed onto Uranus and Neptune. The solar system is an infinitesimally small part of our Milky Way galaxy. The stars are separated by light years. And as you go out of our solar system, you go past stars and stars and stars and stars through a system of hundreds of billions of stars that's called our Milky Way galaxy. That is roughly 100,000 light years across. But our Milky Way is just one of billions of galaxies in the universe, all of which are similar in size. And so the universe really extends far beyond our ability to imagine. The universe contains everything. The sun, the planets, the stars beyond, even the space between the stars. Where did it all come from? How did we become part of it? It's a big question. Scientists don't really know the answer to that. But there are some theories. Most scientists believe the universe started with a bang. A huge explosion took place, which made everything move outwards. The temperature would have been millions of millions of degrees. This hot, expanding universe wasn't anything like the one we see today. The whole thing was like a soup containing all the bits that were later to make up the gases, liquids and materials that now exist. A few minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature would have fallen to about a thousand million degrees. At that temperature, those bits were able to start to stick together and become the building blocks of atoms. Anyway, there wasn't a great deal happening for a while after that. So let's pick up the story half a million years or so later. The temperature was now a thousand degrees. Time for another major change. It was about then that complete atoms with electrons were formed for the first time. Once this happened, the universe became see-through, transparent, and space looked much more like the space we see today. Or rather, more like the space we see through today. It's a bit like having some muddy water that settles out and becomes clear. For a long while, nothing much else happened. But this is where that idea of gravity comes in again. Now, on the moon, the gravity is much less than the Earth, so you can jump higher. Every planet has a different gravity pull. The bigger the planet, the bigger the pull, and the lower you'd be able to jump. This means that when the universe was forming, if some parts were a bit thicker than others, they could clump together even more, pulled by their own gravity. 
Eventually, this formed the stars and galaxies that we see today. Watch this last section again, and as you watch, draw a timeline to show the history of the universe since the Big Bang. Include the temperature at which changes happened. <laughs> <laughs> 